is a professor in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department in the School of the Environment at Yale University. He earned his PhD from the University of Oxford in 2002 and served on the faculty of the University of California, San Diego from 2005 to 2009. Dr. Yetz directs the Yale Center for Biodiversity and Global Ch Change and its Max and its Max Planck Yale Center for Biodiversity Movement of Global Change, an international Max Planck Center. Internationally, he served as co-manager of the Task Force on Data and Knowledge of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem si Service. As chair of his task group on indicators and as lead author on the IPBES Global Assessment. He also co-chairs the Species Population Working Group of the GEO Biodiversity Observation Network and is a UNEP WCMC Honorary Fellow and serves on the steering committee of the Future Earth Natural Assets Network. Dr. Yetz integrates ecological, evolutionary, geographical, and environmental perspectives to study biodiversity dynamics in a changing world. A particular focus is the use of novel technologies and data flows to examine the responses of biodiversity to environmental change across scales. With flagship projects such as the Map of Life, he combines ecology and informatics to support education, conservation, and policy-relevant decision support. He serves on the editorial boards of journals in ecology, evolution, and data science, and has been recognized as ISI highly cited researcher in five years since 2014. He has published over 150 peer-reviewed papers and has mentored 21 postdocs and graduate students with 17 now in tenure track faculty or tenured academic research positions. Please welcome Dr. Yetz. Well, thank you very much and thanks for having me. It's a real uh, honor to be here. I love that this is a, a graduate student organized event. I had to say yes to that. I also love uh, yeah, the interdisciplinary nature of it. Uh, I, I really second what the Vice Provost of Research said earlier, also from my own experience at Yale and other universities. Of, uh, events like this really important, being really important to break down the often rigid walls of, of departments. So it's great to all come together here in the spirit. So thanks for having me and let me see what I can operate this. Uh, thanks for also for the, the, the introduction there. Um, and uh, I wanna take the cue from there where you were already mentioning uh, IPES, the uh, Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, um, and also pick up on what the, the Vice uh, Provost uh, said earlier uh, regarding uh, that science policy interface and that it's sometimes uh, one of the most rewarding uh, experiences to be able to move from research, research insights over into that arena, into the decision-making and policy arena. And I, uh, like, like him, felt that that was one of the really uh, special moments for myself and our work and the community that I work with uh, to be able to, through this IPES process, for example, uh, bring uh, some of the insights that we have over into this other arena. And then more recently also through uh, COP15, which was originally meant to be held in Kunming, China, but then was moved to, to Montreal, Canada, uh, and just uh, concluded in December, uh, bring that into the arena of uh, commitments. Uh, so many of you will be familiar with the uh, 2020, or I hope some of you will be familiar with the 2020 Aichi goals, right, uh, targets. Um, those were formulated sort of starting 2008 through 2010. And this now was the same sort of process, multi-year process uh, um, that concluded in December that brought about the 2030 targets together with a 2050 vision. But I'll, I'll say a little more about that in just a moment. But uh, uh, this convention isn't uh, sitting there in isolation. And in fact, it's uh, um, a much smaller, if you will, convention than this one that most everybody knows about, uh, the climate convention. And that had this 1.5 or two degrees Celsius uh, a target or goal that we all uh, are familiar with. This is a very uh, 
uh, politically powerful, uh, well manifested uh, convention. This one still has uh, growth potential in terms of recognition, but it is the same sort of idea. And there is an immense uh, arena and opportunity for all of us, actually, and I hope many of you in your future careers as well to engage and contribute through what this is, the assessment process, similar to the IPCC reports that you hear about. Here we did uh, multiple reports, continental as well as a global assessment that I contributed to, and we had an, uh, an overarching task group that focused on issues of information and knowledge that I'll, I'll dig in a little deeper. And then these assessments are feeding into uh, then the, the real uh, science policy uh, process where then indeed governments, in this case ministers and presidents, come together and say and agree on a language uh, uh, around commitments for the future. So that's how these things connect with one another and there are sort of interesting parallels. And it's been two, three really, really important years for climate and for biodiversity. But the one exception being uh, in biodiversity, we have it much harder. We can't, nobody, we don't have a, like a simple 1.5 degrees Celsius goal, right? And uh, it, it's much, much bigger than carbon, carbon dioxide uh, or, or, or greenhouse gases. It's much, much more complex. Um, so that's, I think, one of the key reasons why uh, this isn't so quite uh, well manifested yet and why all of us, uh, through our work and also communication uh, and thinking about how we can better communicate, integrate data, information to arrive in products that are more easily understood, how we can all contribute to that effort, because that will ultimately be needed to gain even more uh, weight in that international uh, policy uh, arena. So this. Uh, a gathering, um, and it was a. Uh, I spent way too much time going to these meetings over the last couple of years, but it's also exciting then in Montreal to finally uh, see some of the decisions happening uh, here uh, in December in Montreal. Um, uh, the key decision that happened there was this Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And if you haven't had a chance to look at that, I really encourage you to look at it. Uh, it's a bit of a dry read, but it's not very long. It's uh, got this funky language that only if you're like sitting in these rooms for hours and hours you get to appreciate like okay I guess it's I know now I know why it's there or so long-winded or complicated uh, every word gets negotiated and discussed uh, and uh, sometimes sentences get longer and longer and longer to have the consensus um, but I encourage you to have a, a read through that because uh, this is ultimately how then in this international policy arena our work your work kind of gets digested up right into then uh, recommendations and commitments. Um, the really exciting piece, I'll say a little more about a few of the specific goals and targets, but the real exciting development, I think, for at least from my perspective, and I think many of yours potentially as well, is that alongside the goals and targets for the first time now uh, was also a decision of the measurement. So, and that's encapsulated in this monitoring framework. Sorry, monitoring framework. And that's a whole separate document, a whole separate negotiation and decision. Um, and for the first time now, uh, these policymakers uh, and, uh, didn't just think about, come up with like grand ambitions and commitments. They also uh, realized, well, actually, maybe we should alongside think about how we're going to measure our progress against, along these commitments, right? Because it's nice to have lofty language, but if you can't measure it, you're not going to arrive at a success. And that, for many of us, uh, is the key reason why we feel the 2020 targets had failed, right? Except for one out of those 20 targets, 20 Aichi targets, um, pretty much all others were not achieved. The only one that was achieved sort of was the protected area target because that simply said, well, try and protect 17% of, of land, right? Uh, for example, and that kind of, you can easily measure and, and in, in ways that don't necessarily support biodiversity, uh, you can also potentially achieve through paper parks or, or demarcating large areas that might actually not be so important for biodiversity. So now uh, we are at an entirely new place where we actually have measurements stipulated alongside, and specifically uh, measurements in the form of indicators. And that's what I'll be, be talking mostly about in, in this uh, presentation today. So here are just a few examples uh, of the key uh, or main, most interesting, in my views, uh, goals and targets uh, uh, that came out of this. Goal A is that overarching ambition for 2050 even to achieve uh, this here, resilience of ecosystems, 
uh, reduce the number of threatened species and increase abundance. And then there is also a, a goal, uh, something in there on genetic diversity. So uh, obviously nothing really quantitative in there. So these are overarching ambitions, but it's still, it's great, it's ambitious. Uh, and it calls out the, sort of the three levels of, of biodiversity, if you will. We have a target free, that might be the most prominent one. That's the 30 by 30 target. Some of you might have heard about uh, protected area uh, ambitions. And here we have a 30% quantitative target in there. Um, and thankfully, it also calls out that it's not just about area, but ideally it should also be about biodiversity. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and it should address uh, ecological representation. And then I wanna call out target 21, which is about uh, improving evidence. We should all strive towards better evidence. That means monitoring, right? And that is sort of then feeds into the monitoring framework, all right? So because without the monitoring, without the evidence, without the research and the integration, we're not gonna arrive at that foundation that allows us to measure or make decisions. So let's talk a little more about this one. And in uh, the in original invitation to come here, actually, some of our work in this arena was called out. So I wanna talk a little more about it. So around new technologies for uh, biodiversity monitoring. And then specifically, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this index. So we all know that uh, the existing uh, spatial and taxonomic uh, evidence uh, uh, of, for biodiversity is highly geographically sparse and biased. And this was a result, uh, a, a work uh, published in Nature Communications in 2015, where we did a simple assessment of, well, how many species out of those expected occurring in a particular 100 kilometer cell do actually have any sort of local observation supporting that. So you all know these expert maps, right? Those allow us to uh, have an, they have expected species at least at 100 kilometer resolution They tend to be reliable and that's what we used as expectation. And then we checked actually, well, what data is actually there to support uh, this idea that these species would be occurring there. And you see that Australia, Europe, and North America in warm colors are really well sampled. And then most of the rest is very, very poorly sampled. But we wanted to take this a bit uh, further. And now I'm talking about work by uh, Ruth Oliver, who is now faculty at uh, UC Santa Barbara and Fabiola Yanarilli, um, who just got a Marie uh, Curie Fellowship. Um, uh, uh, on where we're trying to now get this uh, work that we did in 2015 into more of a temporal context and an, an, an indicator type arena. We start out at the species level and think about um, uh, a species distribution in a gridded way. So this is oversimplified, of course, but imagine a species here occurring in these three, five, six grid cells. And then we're simply asking, well, uh, out of these six grid cells where we expect the species to occur, if some sort of other evidence that suggests they're there, do we have actually any on the ground observations? For example, in a particular year that affirm that that species is still there uh, or, or not there. So the data coverage metric is then simply the number of cells with records in relation to the expected cells. And then we can also get into another metric that's the effectiveness. Uh, we can look at, because the number of records alone have often been used to, to capture how well we are progressing in our biodiversity knowledge, but a number of records aren't really an ideal measure for that. Um, and uh, the map of Mexico up, just uh, as you arrive here. <laughs> um, uh, this is very oversimplified, I should say. It's just a cartoon uh, characterization. Um, so uh, um, we can go into a measure of effectiveness um, uh, that says, well, uh, what would be the ideal distribution of records? If we have 100 records, right, how would we have ideally placed them in, in geographic space to be maximally effective in our conference? If they're all sitting in one cell, that's not very effective, right? And I'll, I'll come back to that measure in the very, very end. So um, we can then take this from the species level to the national level and over multiple species and their respective uh, stewardship that countries have. So in this case, this steward species is both the US and Mexico. Mexico has a third of the stewardship or a third of the responsibility, if you will, for that species. Um, this one is an endemic to Mexico and it has 100%. We can then uh, look at that metric that I just said in that context. And then we can take things empirical. And here for two example species, 
we, we exercise this through and now go year by year by year. We're looking at all the records of the Jagger, all the records of the, the color techery. And we see here how um, the number of records here uh, of that species have gone up. So the first uh, row here, sorry, we lost the, the, uh, the, the title, is the number of records, how they have increased. Uh, uh, this is the number of records per year. A lot of records for the peccary generally been going up. Um, and then here, uh, this is now that species information uh, score. It's simply the portion, the pr proportion of cells in which we expect the species to occur that had any sort of record against them in a particular year. And uh, you see that they also have been increasing. So we tend to capture the species better through our sampling over the years. And then we can divvy this up uh, by, by region, uh, by country in this case. And you see that Costa Rica uh, and Mexico in particular have been uh, increasing their uh, measurements for these species. Uh, there's been a lot of growth in data for these species in an spatially effective way, uh, not so much in, in Brazil. We can then extend that assessment over uh, to about a 30,000 species of terrestrial vertebrates. And then uh, over all of those, uh, integrate and assess how well uh, coverage uh, might have increased uh, over the years or, or in, what, in what the coverage is in a particular year. And you see here in, in red uh, places that uh, have very high coverage and uh, in a separate analysis, we find that in most of these countries, the coverage has also increased over the years. Have a look at that paper that I, uh, I referenced there earlier, if you want to look at some of the uh, individual trends. But you can also uh, go on this website and click on any of these countries and select your favorite species group and a look at these particular trends in detail. Now, these values are uh, the species information index. So for a particular species group, in this case, it's terrestrial vertebrates, we are year by year able to track how well are we progressing in our evidence base for the spatiotemporal distribution of these species. So at the country level, we can measure that. And that's what policymakers ultimately want. They don't want anything more detailed. They want like this number, are we doing better or not, right? But we as scientists obviously are, are called for to build up this number in a rigorous way, in a transparent way, in a way that sort of disaggregates all the way down to a single species and ultimately the data underpinning that. This is based on uh, GBIF uh, data and we're able to add more and more data sets to that over time. So it's based on publicly available uh, data. So some countries are still not fully sharing uh, all the potential data that they might have. So that obviously impacting this, but this is all about, it's about uh, open accessible uh, data, right? That's where this indicator is assessing the growth. And uh, if we were to just look at the growth in number of records, yes, that's certainly going up and I'll talk a little more about that. Um, and it's particularly large, that increase for birds, which have seen immense citizen science activity that have always been very well sampled, uh, uh, but then uh, been increasing particularly strongly. Now, the, the species information index or data coverage has also been increasing particularly strongly in birds. And it's actually not been increasing that strongly for some of these other species groups. And you see that actually it was a real peak back in the 1970s. Um, for amphibians, interesting, and we look back a little more and that's when some of the really big survey pushes happen in different parts of the world happened to overlap. So there were like country level survey efforts for amphibians or atlases published, et cetera. Some of the first efforts, South Africa and some other places. And, um, but it's not been uh, uh, increasing as strongly as we, one would might think, right? Um, so there's certainly a lot of need, a lot of potential, especially what we just heard uh, from the previous talk, right? Uh, some of the most threatened species, impacted species from multiple sides, uh, diseases, land cover change, climate change uh, are, are here, our amphibians, for example, and uh, uh, we are not doing so well in our coverage. We're doing really, really well for birds, but here's an important other lesson. I mentioned that effectiveness metric in the beginning. Um, so while we tend to be sort of not changing things very much for these other groups, for birds, it's really going down. So a flip side of all this massive number of uh, data that we're getting for birds from citizen scientists, like loading, uploading their, their the checklists from their backyard, which is all great. I'm not saying that's not useful data, 
Um, but in terms of growing the actual global evidence base that can support decision-making and assessment, uh, uh, our effectiveness has been going really, really down. So a record is not a record, right? So we need to be careful to not just count records, we need to count, assess evidence. Uh, and I'll take that a little further in a moment. Okay, so um, we are uh, uh, obviously in a real uh, important time to do better in assessing how well biodiversity might respond to change. Uh, uh, so assessment, but then also decision support, what can we best do to safeguard uh, biodiversity? And uh, um, what I've documented here so far was still mostly uh, relatively traditional data. So citizen science data is coming in there now in a, in a great way, but there is a, a whole additional arena been developing uh, over the last several years uh, of automated sensors, tracking devices. I already mentioned community science uh, and uh, data mobilization contributing to a better, better understanding. So we've covered these here mostly, but let me talk a little more about these with just a, a, a two example uh, a project. Because this together then uh, really takes us into a new era. Um, an era where we have uh, data coming from not just one type of source, but multi type or data type, but multiple data types and sources. And we have this coming along as well, right? Uh, uh, satellite based and aerial remote sensing that I'll be talking more about. So, how can these advances best sort of cross pollinate, cross inform each other? And how can integration of these data types and sources help uh, get us forward in growing global biodiversity knowledge? So as we look at this growth in the number of records, and this is again just records, um, we see how some other data types are, are adding on in a major way. So here is MoveBank, uh, for example, that I'll be talking about in just a moment. And what's not in there yet, but will be coming soon in a specified way, are uh, this type of data, this type of data, camera trap data. So uh, you're all familiar with it. Uh, you've seen the cute images of animals in all sorts of positions and behaviors getting caught on these cameras. Um, it's also become a citizen science or community science activity, right? So several of us are putting those up in our favorite places. Um, and uh, uh, together with a, a number of partners, we have instigated that uh, project called Wildlife Insights that is trying to now think about this new data type at a global scale across species. So agnostic, whether it's birds or mammals, uh, or indeed other species groups, um, trying to bring together uh, all these rapidly growing camera trap data that's getting shared. So this is particularly uh, important uh, through having Google on board here. So they're contributing a lot of computational power. And we have um, deep learning experts that are doing some of the automated image object recognition and then species identification. Uh, so check it out. If you have camera trap data yourself, you can sort of throw in your images and it will, for most cases, do a pretty good job in identifying those uh, two species for you. And then you have an ability to share uh, some of these data for further analysis. Obviously, there's an embargo opportunity as well. Um, but uh, we are already seeing uh, through the combination of, of, of some of these other data sets, so WCS, Smithsonian, et cetera, have already put in all their data, uh, as well as individuals, how much this type of data can complement existing data, can help our understanding of biodiversity distributions and, and trends. Here's just an example for this Eastern red forest rat in Madagascar, how, yes, we have a number of observations uh, that are of the traditional type. So this might be museum specimen or community, well, not so traditional, but now also community science, but for uh, these types of uh, 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 um, uh, uh, ground living uh, small mammals, there isn't that much community science coming through because uh, they're hard to see, of course. But there are these, these sort of data from GBIF here in blue. And then increasingly, so we have for several of these parts of the range, camera trap data. And they're filling in uh, uh, more and more in recent years. And as we combine these, you see how we are uh, improving that species information index for that species now more and more, or we are keeping it alive, if you will, increasingly with um, camera trap data, not other traditional data types. 
And generally, we find that, of course, while occurrences annually are increasing in number, we are capturing about um, uh, 10,000, uh, um, I think that's birds and mammals combined species annually through uh, any data source in GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, where data is coming together that's publicly shared. Um, camera trap data is uh, increasing in the number of species it delivers every year uh, as information. So over a thousand now. Um, here, uh, uh, we are distinguishing uh, two green lines here. Dark green is the one that's all data and, and light green is the one that's unembargoed. So we have a bit of a, uh, a lack of immediacy here because people put embargoes on their data, understandably in, in most cases, and so that uh, uh, we are lagging a little bit behind. But you see that data will come through eventually and tell us about what's been happening in that year. In terms of effort days, so grid cell years in which some sort of sampling happened, Camera trap, trapping is already beating uh, other types of data because this is obviously just presence records, so much one of observation. And this uh, data is already adding substantially to uh, our understanding of, of status and trends of species uh, for a whole set of species. Obviously, camera trapping is limited for now uh, and will be for a time, but uh, uh, with drones and other ways of camera placement and funky places. Um, uh, the potential is growing. I have a PhD student now doing arboreal camera trapping, for example, and uh, uh, there's a whole other uh, um, a layer of the forest to be more and more discovered, actually, through that technology, if you're able to place the cameras. Uh, cameras. But uh, So we're necessarily limited in the sets of species we're able to sample with camera traps. This is not so good for, for reptiles or for insects, uh, etc. But uh, for mammals, for many mammal species, we're able to improve um, that species information index that I mentioned earlier. So not just add on records, but really add knowledge, add information uh, in a substantial way. So this blue would be just the traditional data and then blue, light blue, and then dark blue is when we combine it with the camera trap data now. You see, we are really moving things up substantially. So we are adding on these additional camera trap occurrences to the, um, existing traditional occurrences to arrive at the combined occurrences. And then this would be your species information index. So thanks to the camera trap data, half of the expected cells for that species have had some sort of sampling and detection of that species in that year. Make sense? Right. So uh, for a lot of species, we're really able to advance evidence. And then uh, that is helping at the national scale, right? And this brings us back again to the policy framework. Um, we are able to advance the foundation for better decision making and assessment in these countries significantly through the addition of camera trap data. So in Rwanda, Suriname, uh, Thailand, places or Israel, where places where uh, there are a lot of camera trappable species or and a lot of camera trapping activity, uh, we're already seeing an improvement in that evidence base measured by that species information index um, that is uh, really, really substantial. And this is just the start. Uh, um, camera trapping through community science, through NGOs, and now increasingly through more and more technologies that can help uh, additional placement of these sensors as I think a really important future. Second data type, animal tracking. Look at this poor elk. Monique the space elk, it was called. New York Times article, 1970. 70. Um, so this wouldn't go through any uh, permit review anymore uh, these days, uh, but it somehow did back then. And uh, uh, that was the first uh, sort of prominent, at least, attempt of uh, a tagging uh, a, 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 an animal uh, in a way where you could ultimately follow its uh, footsteps uh, electronically. And uh, obviously, the technology has advanced substantially since. and. Uh, Animal movement data uh, has grown in a really powerful way. 
Ah, uh, here we go. No. Uh, actually, nobody. Let's just leave it like this. Yeah, I'll go back again to that's why uh, it doesn't work in full screen mode. So uh, these are real uh, CPS tracking uh, data. So individuals that have, uh, and this is storks, for example, here migrating to uh, Africa and then onwards to uh, Kenya, where they would be interacting, for example, bumping into buffaloes that uh, have CPS tags on them. These are real tags. Um, real individuals, storks moving on here, interacting uh, with, where are we, uh, rhinos or buffaloes again, or uh, in South Africa, elephants, and in blue, what do we have here? Uh, so this is less about the specific species ecology. It's really just trying to visualize to you how, uh, these are then storks and raptors moving back, migrating back to Europe. Um, visualizing to you how um, much data there is and how much that's offering geographic coverage, but moreover, how that is biological data, right? It's actual behavioral data um, telling us about individuals and their use of, uh, of space over time. And uh, that data has grown uh, dramatically over the past years and with the the focus, uh, and it's the focus of that, that uh, partnership with Max Planck, where they have been driving forward the technology in particular here, these really small sensors, five gram and smaller, that you can read out through what was envisioned uh, a box on the space station until uh, the Ukraine war and Russia decided to switch it off. Um, so it was all working nicely for nine months. And then um, unfortunately, uh, we hope the data for some of these very individuals that I'm showing you photos of here uh, is still being collected and stored somewhere and will become available again someday, but they stopped uh, sharing the data, unfortunately. It was a collaboration uh, with Russia where that um, receptor was installed on this Russian um, module of the space station. Uh, but it was really, really cool. It was indeed a space technology. It is space uh, technology where uh, the actual satellite or center, if you will, is, is the animal and uh, in space is the receiver of that information, right? But it is near global in scope. Uh, and these sensors, essentially they have a GPS module on them, uh, solar panels, uh, they can live for years uh, with that battery that they have and every hour or less, they're able to provide the location of that particular individual. So we've moved a long way from the uh, Monique, the space elk to uh, individual species as small as the European blackbird being able to carry these tags and then deliver remotely that information to your computer. Um, and that uh, uh, really got us excited about this vision of uh, biological earth observations with animals as sensors and this vision of uh, maybe 100,000 sentinels of biodiversity change. If you're able to get tags on 100,000 individuals simultaneously and able to re-tag every few years or so, it's not a crazy amount of effort. We sort of estimated at about a $20 million uh, or so uh, a budget. Um, you could have for hundreds of hundreds of species, uh, individuals roaming around the landscape. And then uh, if you will, telling you about how they're interacting with that landscape, whether they're still using that same place that they or another individual used the same year before, whether that environment is still there whether the environment has changed. And they're able to fill in, obviously, the uh, geography of species distributions and habitat use in great, great detail. Um, so that was the larger vision that we were able to look at that biological signal and integrate it also with, with um, remote sensing to get to our, an overall global system uh, for monitoring uh, biodiversity change. Happy to chat more about this, it's a particularly good topic over a beer. It's very visionary what might be possible there. Um, but uh, uh, the technology has been developing really, really rapidly. And there are new ways now, alternatives already in development for that space station, small CubeSats that will carry the different types of receivers with the same tag technology. Uh, so uh, expect more there later this year or next year. Now, remote sensing is the other important piece here, right? So this is uh, biological data in, of sorts, right? When we look at the greenness of the vegetation or leaf chemistry, et cetera. Um, but 
uh, also the abiotic variables that we're able to capture now in great spatial and temporal detail through Earth orbiting sensors uh, and a whole suite of new sensors that are increasingly biologically relevant and interesting uh, adds a whole other dimension of knowledge to that those occurrence informations or uh, behaviors that I was just uh, showing you. And uh, we are able to now re-envision, if you will, uh, Grinnell's uh, environmental niche. So 1917, curator at Berkeley, he was the first to sort of conceive this idea. Well, if we know where species is, we, are, we are know where what it requires in terms of niche requirements, we can put it on the map and vice versa, right? And uh, this is now through technology uh, become really possible in a very powerful and scalable way that you take biological attributes such as the occurrence of a species, combine it with this remotely sensed environmental signal and high spatial and temporal resolution to then separate presence from absence. Think of a little simple logistic regression, for example, and make a prediction of where, what, might, what might be suitable or not so suitable pixels for a species and how that might change over time. Now, with support from uh, a lot of partners, in particular the half F project and the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, we were able to uh, work in a large team and do a real big push on empirically moving forward this concept that we developed as part of the GEO Biodiversity Observation Network Species Population Working Group, where we're going from these sparse and biased occurrences that I've been talking about in space and time of species. And we're combining them with this stack of remotely sensed contiguous layers to arrive what we, at what we've called the essential biodiversity variable. Some of you might have heard of the essential climate variable uh, in, that's really been helping the IPCC space. Uh, here, the species population essential biodiversity variable, essentially the abundance or probability of occurrence of a species in a particular pixel in, in, in time across many species. Now, if you have that, you can go from there and calculate a whole range of metrics, aggregate metrics indicators that would inform you about the changes in space and time. And you can aggregate that for a particular country, for example, and a year. And that then allows us to bring things back again to these goals and targets and their measurement. I've already talked earlier about the species information index and the species information index is nothing different than just counting and aggregating, if you will, the records, right? What we're now doing is bring in remote sensing and models to get at some uh, model-supported inference that gets us to these other indicators, the species protection index to support target-free measurements, species habitat index support goal A. So what we're doing is we're taking these different types of biodiversity data, combine them with remote sensing to arrive then in uh, red here at a a much more detailed characterization of a species distribution in a particular year. You see that the expert map isn't really usable at a kilometer resolution. The points that we have growing rapidly from citizen science and camera trapping, et cetera, also aren't giving you the full picture. It's the combination then with remote sensing and models that allows us to fill in in detail where that particular hummingbird species might actually be occurring and where it might be losing habitat or where it might be experiencing uh, uh, petition, additional protection and thereby uh, get better protected. So we've been able to develop one kilometer resolution uh, richness maps based on single species predictions for hummingbirds. And we're able to now look at these distributions and relate them to habitat loss. Uh, here we're looking at the zebra ducker in West Africa, a very, very understudied species. The older records come from here would never let us appreciate what's going on up there. This is the blob map, the expert map that alone wouldn't be so helpful either. We now have a model supported prediction of the actual range that we link in land cover for. So this is the remaining forest and uh, combine, combined with right elevation for that species in this region. And through also remote sensing, we were able to over the last 20 years monitor, assess how much habitat, suitable habitat for that species has been lost. So it's been losing over 20% of its habitat suitable range and likely thereby population uh, just in the last 20 years, these red pixels. You can then link that to the portions of this range in particular countries. So Liberia has the main stewardship for that species, but also does uh, several, it's also do several other countries, right? And Cote d'Ivoire has been doing a really poor job in uh, looking after that species in its territory, right? It's lost over 
half of its range in original range in that country. We were able to aggregate that up over across 20,000 species for which we were able to do this assessment. And you can look at each one of them in the Map of Life website, uh, if you're interested, have poke around. And we're able to then uh, uh, look at uh, uh, th this particular trend for all of these species to arrive at what's the species habitat index for a particular uh, country. That is now uh, um, a component indicator in the monitoring framework of the CBD that I mentioned earlier. So this is something that countries are using to report their progress in conserving populations of species. The important thing here is that you're able to do that at the species level, but globally and in a comparable way in each country. You got to bring it back again to the country level to have policy relevance, right? And the same or similar metric, same sort of idea is the species protection index where we're then simply overlaying, it's a very simple exercise. We're taking that same range in a particular year and we're relating it to the existing reserves in the region to simply ask, well, what for percent of habitat and thereby probably population roughly is, um, has some sort of formal protection? And is that achieving the target for the species? For species with really small population sizes and narrow ranges, the target is usually we should protect all or most of it. If a species is nearly globally distributed, we go with a 10% uh, and uh, protection of that global or of that large range. So that's the target. So that's what we should be protecting. And we're only realizing about a third of that. So uh, here again, we can look at how different countries are achieving their protection target. Um, Liberia, for example, is only achieving 10% of the target for that species. We cal calculate that for all 600 species for which we have data for Cote d'Ivoire, all the 500 for Liberia, et cetera, et cetera, to then arrive at this metric. On average, how are we improving in this adequate representation of species in reserves? 100% would mean 100. All species are adequately represented in reserves. We have the target achieved for all species, and zero would be none. And here it's really interesting, right? Even though uh, Sri Lanka has been increasing its protected area, right? That was one of the Aichi targets, increased protected area. They have not done a very good job in actually translating that in representation of their species. Or one should say there is real potential to do better in the future, right? Um, here in Mongolia, they actually took a very uh, careful approach uh, guided by, uh, I think it was the Nature Conservancy, to... Uh, um, uh, represent species and then use an optimized uh, reserve design approach. And they were able to achieve a really, really high representation with relatively small increases. You can explore these data um, also on the half earth map, if you're interested, that's really a sort of nice 3D uh, spinning globe uh, representation of some of this information and uh, is very interactive. On map of life, you can explore each of these three indicators and how they interact with one another. And uh, um, I'm kind of at the end of my talk. Let me just very quickly flip through a few slides, just give you a visual glimpse of, of something we've done for the US specifically, and then maybe we can follow up more on that in the questions. So essentially, we've done the same exercise that I showed you globally, specifically for the US with particularly detailed data. The US has a lot of data, uh, and we did that in collaboration with a large group, uh, and now supporting also folks over at USGS that are. Uh, charged with this particular effort, America the Beautiful. I hope many of you have heard of the America of the Beautiful initiative by Biden's administration. Um, and what we're trying to do there is, um, first of all, get to a better understanding, in this case, one kilometer understanding of species richness and rarity, not just for vertebrates, but also for uh, invertebrates and plants. And we could spend an hour just talking about these patterns, but uh, that's a, another talk for another day. It's really amazing to see uh, these patterns in that detail uh, and uh, look how they vary across taxa. But the key point I wanted to make, I didn't want to miss making it. I was talking about Mongolia and Sri Lanka earlier in terms of species protection index. We can calculate the same metric. How, how well are you adequately representing species in your region at the state level within the United States? And the uh, uh, diamond is that score. So uh, Michigan, Nevada, 
uh, California is in there as well, Arizona, they're all up there in the 50 to 100% range. So for 50 to 100% of the species groups that I just showed you, uh, adequate representation in existing reserves is happening. Over here, we're at the other end. Now we could begin to, to include other lands, right? So this is just using formally declared protected areas. So there's, I know there's a lot of other conservation activity going on in all these states, and that's important to consider. But if you just count the formal reserve, uh, we are at, uh, below the level of um, Sri Lanka and probably 80% of the countries of the world uh, here in, in Texas in terms of adequate representation of species and reserves. Um, anyway. <laughs> I should say these are draft results, uh, not to be distributed on so social media quite yet. Uh, and we want to support it with really robust additional analysis. But uh, anyway, I wanted to leave you with that. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah. You know, that's all the species. Um, so essentially, some species are adequately represented, but most are over here. Sorry, I was moving through this quickly. Um, 